I'd very much like to thank the speakers for your time and for your participation. And at this point, I'd like to introduce the speakers. So the first speaker um, will be Vic, Dr. Vic Plant, who is the Chief Scientific and Chief Science Advisor at the Natural Resources, Can at Natural Resources Canada, where he is responsible for providing strategic direction to build capacity within the organization's scientific community, promoting a departmental vision for science and technology, and providing an assessment of future needs. He holds a doctorate from the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto and two master's degrees, one in business administration and one in information technology. Prior to joining the NRC, or um, um, excuse me, uh, Natural Resources Canada, he attained progressively strategic positions in a number of leading software enterprises. And immediately prior, he was the senior technical advisor of applied artificial intelligence at the Mars Discovery District, a technology startup in Toronto. Um, the next up is Dr. Sarah Gallagher. She is the scientific advisor to the president of the Canadian Space Agency, where she is the liaison to the space science community, community and the chief science advisor of Canada. She has been a professor of physics and astronomy at Western University since 2008, and her research focuses on supermassive black holes and galaxies. Dr. Gallagher teaches first year physics and regularly talks to the public about astronomy and space science. And I think we can sneak in a little um, example uh, video of that uh, maybe at a later time in this session. Dr. Pascal Michel is the Chief Scientific Officer of the Public Health Agency of Canada, where he is responsible for overseeing and leading excellence and innovation in agency science, as well as to provide corporate leadership on science policy issues. He holds a doctorate degree in veterinary medicine, a master's in preventative veterinary medicine, and a PhD in epidemiology. Throughout his career, his work in government held various cross appointments within academia, co founded a multi sectoral research center on zoonotic diseases and decision sciences, and built a long lasting uh, relationship with the United Nations in relation to the role of space technologies to improve global health and outcomes. Our final panelist today is Dr. Um, Sean Marshall. And Sean is a glaciologist and climatologist at the University of Calgary, where he held the Canadian, or excuse me, the Canada Research Chair in Climate Change from 2007 to 2017. His research examines glacier climate processes and glacier response to climate change, including implications for water resources and global sea level rise. Dr. Marshall currently represents Canada at the Cryosphere Working Group, um, excuse me, as the Cryosphere Working Group lead in the International Arctic Science Committee and as a member of the Science Leadership Council of the International Mountain Research Initiative. Since 2019, Dr. Marshall has been seconded with the federal government, where he is serving the Department Science Advisor at um, Environment and Climate Change Canada. So with that being said, welcome everyone. I, I think it's, it goes without speaking that we're, we're in for a treat, like I mentioned. So with that being said, I'd like to open it up to our first question. And I think um, I'm just going to take a peek here. And great, perfect. Um, so we'll start with Dr. Pant, followed by Dr. Gallagher, Michelle, and Marshall. So the first question is, is a broad one. It's, can you explain what a science advisor is and how your role is similar or different to that definition? What is your current title? And if you could summarize what you do in this role um, with a big picture perspective and how your work fits into the government's uh, goals and priorities, um, that would be wonderful. And then this is a three-parter question. I can repeat this if needed. What is your educational and career background that, that led you to this role and what helped you to get to where you are today? So Dr. Pant, welcome and um, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. It's a pleasure. And also thank you to Meherdad for bringing us together. Always uh, an honor to join my esteemed uh, colleagues, Sean and, and Sarah and Pascal. We, we have great conversations uh, around Dr. Mona Niemer's table. So it's really my privilege to be here. So thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. So the science advisor role is very interesting. And, and I suppose we all take our cues from Dr. Mona Niemer as the exemplar uh, of the science advisor community within the government of Canada. So really, I look at it as three distinct but interrelated synergistic 
things that that science advisors do so i would say the first thing is science advice i mean as the name suggests certainly uh, at the at the executive management table which comprises of our deputy minister or the president if it's an agency the associate deputy minister the adms from policy from corporate from from science uh, everybody's together at the smc table a senior management committee table how do we take the insights from the science of our department and then present that to these executive leaders within the organization to make strategic decisions for not just the short term the mid term but even the long range plans of our department so uh, to give you a concrete example uh, topics could be broad ranging enterprise wide science topics like scientific integrity open science citizen science data science so things that apply to any kind of science that goes on within our department uh, so that's an important part of the part of the role uh, the second part of the role which i think is also very important and that that's why we really appreciate having this occasion to partner with the Canadian Science Policy Center is that outreach and outreach really also has two dimensions to it in my mind one of it is knowledge sharing so we come and we meet folks and we share with them the kind of work that our scientists do and we learn from them and this could be in a university setting or in a private research lab or in uh, some maybe non science uh, set setting where we can talk about the kind of work that we do learn from others about the kind of work that they do so there's outreach is great from a knowledge sharing perspective but outreach is also great from a professional networking perspective because we want to make sure that from a hr resilience perspective and from a human capital uh, perspective we want to make sure that we're attracting and recruiting and retaining top scientific talent from universities from private organizations from other uh, locations so so outreach is important because we are able to sort of let people know about the kinds of opportunities that exist whether or not they are job opportunities whether or not they are partnership type opportunities uh, with private research labs or university labs and things like that so outreach i would say is is a second very important aspect of what we do as science advisors and the third part of it is sort of the executive management of it so if we do have a scientific integrity policy that we need to follow or an open science action plan we need to implement in the department then there needs to be some sector there needs to be some group some team within a department or agency that's responsible for actually delivering on it to implement it and to measure it track it do so in a way that's compliant with governance rules and regulations so that's the third part of it is being that executive champion within the department to actually go from the aspirational to the operational so that's really what that is in terms of my role my my title is chief scientist and chief science advisor and with respect to my background and thank you megan for for kindly introducing me earlier so i have a background so as in terms of my phd it's in information science so i'm an information scientist by training but before that i've i've done uh, degrees in computer science degrees in business administration uh, just to sort of have a broad and a well-rounded set of skills that can help me to contribute my capabilities in a meaningful way uh, in any kind of an organizational setting so i'll stop right there thank you megan Great, thank you. Um, and now we are turning it over to Dr. Gallagher, please. Thanks, Megan, and it's a pleasure to be here um, with you and with my colleagues. Um, as Vic, Vic did a fantastic job of introducing many aspects of, uh, of the job as science advisor. So I'll highlight the ways in which mine is actually a little bit different um, than it is for my colleagues. And part of it is just the nature of the Canadian Space Agency um, as opposed to the big departments. So we're, first of all, a lot smaller than a lot of the big departments. We have about 800 employees as opposed to thousands in many of, uh, in many of the other big departments. Um, we also don't have a lot of internal research capacity at the Canadian Space Agency. So we're a relatively small agency, um, and so we don't have a lot of science activity that's happening inside the agency. We have a tremendous amount of engineering expertise, um, very uh, aerospace engineers, systems engineers, thermal engineers, all of the all of the different components of the nuts and bolts of making sure things function in space and people stay alive in space. Um, so we have a lot of internal expertise in that domain, but not so much in science. So what's distinct about my role, as opposed to the ones that, uh, that Vic highlighted, is that um, we have a lot of external engagement, which is part of what he was talking about in terms of outreach, but we work very closely with industry as well as academia and also our colleagues in other government departments. So when we wanna talk about uh, putting something in space, um, that's our domain, that's our expertise, our, we're the space people. So uh, so we, we figure out the launch, we make sure that sure that it works, but often we're not the people who actually use the data. 
So Vic and Pascal and Sean and scientists across Canada in the government and also in academia are generally the ones who are using the data. So we're really this sort of um, catalyst enabler who have the space expertise um, so that other people can, um, but, but typically other communities are actually using that information. So we have a, just sort of a different role than a lot of the other departments. So what that means is that for me as a science advisor, uh, one of the most important things I do in addition to uh, what Vic mentioned of advising the executive, which I sit at the executive table as well and advise them, my specific title is I'm the science advisor to the president. So um, so I speak with uh, Lisa Campbell, who's our president and the, and the vice presidents on a regular basis and sit at the executive committee. Um, but I also am in a liaison to lots of different communities, um, different scientific communities. So we have astronomers and planetary scientists and earth scientists and lots of different scientific domains. And because I am not, I have a position where 50% of my time is for the Canadian Space Agency and 50% of the time is for Western University, where I'm a professor. Um, I really straddle that um, academic government role. And I've been a professor who applies for research dollars and I have worked on training students and I have tried to help my students get jobs in industry. So I have that piece of the pie as well as sitting at the table and understanding the demands and the requirements and the governance and all of those pieces of the government work that's really essential. So I see that I think a big part of my role is actually to be sort of a translator and to some extent that that ties in with the knowledge mobilization that Vic mentioned, but it's really about explaining to people at the agency, like, this is why this structure for a grant is a huge pain in the neck for somebody at a university and explaining to people at the university, like, that's an unreasonable expectation. That's just, you know, not reasonable to expect that the agency can act in this way that you think it should. So I think that's a pretty important role. Um, and I also work as, I think, almost a consultant to a lot of the, of the program teams within the Canadian Space Agency. Why? So they'll they'll just say, we want your advice on how do we incorporate, you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion into our grant calls? Um, how do we make sure that uh, we are uh, reaching the communities that we need to reach? We're putting together an AI strategy. What's your what's your suggestion on this? So um, I, in that sense, I'm very reactive. So someone and I get invited into lots of different. Um, meetings and lots of different teams just to get my advice, just uh, for advice. In terms of my path, uh, so as I mentioned, I'm currently a professor. I'm an astrophysicist, so I was trained in um, astronomy and astrophysics. I still have an active research program and I train students. Um, the piece of of my job that sort of led me into the into being a science advisor is that um, at a certain point in my career, um, I was asked or I volunteered to serve on teams that were looking at developing the science plans for next generation telescopes, either on in space or on the ground. And this is a really exciting thing to do. It's a visioning exercise where you think, okay, what are our big science questions? What do we need to answer those questions? And what that requires is you bring together a big team, you think about your science questions, you, you come up with the requirements of the, the technical requirements for the kinds of instruments and the kinds of facilities that you need to build. Um, and then you have to go out and find people who are excited about it and are willing to, to give you money so that you can advance uh, both the science and the technical requirements. And that kind of activity was perfect training for uh, for becoming a science advisor because it requires big picture thinking. It requires uh, putting teams in place, um, connecting with different partners, whether it's industry, other other universities, the granting councils, the space agency. And so that was really fantastic preparation for this kind of work. And uh, and when the job was posted for for um, for for this position, I got into that stage where I thought, oh, I really love all this planning and visioning and building teams. I wish I was getting paid for it. And then uh, and then this job came up, and and so I could. So uh, so that was how I wound up where I am. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, Dr. Michelle. Oui, donc d'abord bonjour à tous. C'est un grand 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 plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui et Un chapeau uh, uh, CFPC pour avoir organisé cette session. So it's it's hard not to uh, drift onto the energy of my um, colleagues there, like to see how 
uh, totally engaged and committed they are to the position. It's, it's beautiful to, to be third there because, again, like Sarah, I'm going to add on to what the important concept of that Dick and Sarah says. And so there's, I think the concept here is that there's a different flavor of science leadership in organization. Uh, uh, chief scientist, the chief science advisor, chief science officer, uh, departmental science advisor, and then there's some functions that we grab onto this, you know, uh, scientific uh, integrity leads and chief science data officers and all of those are sub component of, of broad roles that I have. So as for myself, the Public Health Agency of Canada has chosen to have a chief science officer. That's the kind of the flavor that they, they decided to have. Uh, first, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada is the organization right now uh, taking care of Canadians for prevention and, and, and a whole bunch of um, of protection and measures uh, for dealing with things such as uh, the COVID, for example, and uh, prior to this, we deal with uh, many different other types of aspects of, of health issues. So health and public health is very much uh, um, um, hinges on science. And to have someone that kind of a chapeau all of the activities and a channel also outside for um, reaching to collaboration uh, both private sectors and academic sectors and governmental sectors. I think that was the essence of having a chief science officer there. I usually summarize my role with the three key words. There's, a, there's, a, there's one notion of leadership. And so to be the person that has uh, the beautiful uh, duty of reaching out to others or being the one to phone call in when you want to reach broadly into the agency in speaking science. And so that's that's a, that's a beautiful aspect of, of my, my function. The second function is actually a little less, less known and, and maybe not as, um, as evident in, the, in my yeah. colleagues' uh, uh, function, but it, it speaks about- Pascal, the, apologize to interrupt you. Um, it sounds like there's a quali uh, sound quality. Do you mind just speaking up a little bit? It sounds okay on my end, but we had a few notes um, coming in that it might be a, a little quiet. All right, if I speak like this, does that sound better? Maybe thumbs up. Yes. Sounds good. Get great. some nods here from the panelists. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. Um, a second notion that I was about to say about my function is uh, is uh, oversight. And so, um, in order to ensure that we do the science right and we do the right science, we need someone that looks at you know whether we are following the right policies, whether we are um, the, the conducting the research the way our expectation is. is and so we need someone to lead um, those science policy issues, but also some time, um, unfortunately, to investigate some cases and to see you know, how, how, um, how we can address some of the issues that we have. And so we put that function in within the chief science officer function as well. And the last aspect is to um, enable the efficient programming of research in, in other places. And so if there is a function to have, so for example, if I mentioned um, we've got two beautiful um, publications, like top-notch publication of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Well, they serve all programs, they serve all branches, they serve all sectors. And so we put that function in within the Chief Science Officer Office in order to serve horizontally this kind of a horizontal kind of a support to many others. And so that's kind of a broadly how we first designed that aspect. But of course, the advisory aspect of my role is also uh, a little bit more internal. And so VP, president, other kind of senior people sometimes call me in order to get some advice. I have a presence at governance tables in order to voice <clears throat> some aspects of strategic orientations and integrations of the science and the policy. Right now, the big tag name for our, our organization right now is to raise the voice of science within public health. And re really, that, that speaks really uh, very much around uh, a role that is close to my office, but close to other kind of a, a leadership office and within the Public Health Agency of Canada. So briefly speaking about my, my past, um, I've, I've, I've never intended to, to be a science advisor. I'll, I'll be very honest. And, and, but the trigger point, if I speak to you, Sarah's comment for me, was the notion of wanting to make a difference and to be slightly unhappy with some of the way things were actually happening. And, 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 and in raising my hands and being involved and being engaged and saying, you know, we should do this way, you know, this way would have a better promotion you know, or this way would have a better integration of science in there. At some point in time, some of the, uh, my managers just said, how, you know, Pascal, just go in and, and how about you, you do get involved in writing the strategy. You do get involved in getting more advice. 
And it's it's a bit like an, a second career for me to, to get into that zone. I was like my colleague, very much involved in academic research. I've been involved in, in different universities in Canada, producing research, um, uh, coaching students, and this dynamic of knowledge production. Um, it was very kind of my day-to-day -day things. But this this moving into advisory, oversight, leadership, and enabling was really one of being very much relevant in in directing organization in improving their science outcome. And, and the way we do science. Um, I'll stop there, Megan. Thank you. Great. And last but not least, Dr. Marshall. Uh, thank you, Megan. And I will echo a lot of what my great colleagues have said, and also thank CSPC, Merded, Kayla, Soa for putting this on. I've had the really good fortune of being involved with CSPC on the conference committee for the last few years. And it's, yeah, you, you do a wonderful service to the country, and I'll, I'll maybe come back to this later, but it's a it's a really great way to get involved at the science policy interface with, within Canada. That was my entry to this world, in, in fact. Um, but my my I'll say a bit about my current role. Megan, you asked us to to talk about what is science advice to us, or what is a science advisor role? And I guess at the highest level, it's it's the process of bringing to the table objective evidence to support complicated decisions and priorities and investments and, and policy and that, that almost sounds simple but there's so many within federal government departments there's so many layers between the operational scientists the lab and field scientists and those tables where a lot of the decisions and policies are being developed so i think for all four of us our role is partly just to be champions of science and helping to bring that grassroots science <laughs> fundamental bench and field science to those tables and to be a real strong voice for that evidence, that scientific evidence. And it's more than just data or scientific papers. It's actually a way of thinking. <laughs> and many of the people joining the call will be working in science and you'll, you'll know what I mean by that. It's just intrinsically objective, apolitical, often it's longer term thinking than maybe corporate or political mandates. And so it's our job to be constantly thinking about sustainability of, in my case, environment and issues. And if you're coming to climate or water or Arctic or so many of the issues I'm talking about and working with on a day-to-day -day basis, it's we're really thinking about, you know, net zero by 2050. This is the long-term plan where you need that foundational science and it needs to really strong commitment to that science. And it's our responsibility to, to help be that champion, I think. Um, and I could give examples of that, but I'll leave it there for now. In, in my role at Environment and Climate Change Canada, I'm very similar to Sarah's. I'm the Departmental Science Advisor, and I'm uh, a split between the University of Calgary and ECCC. Um, I was fortunate. I've been nicely supported by uh, University of Calgary. They've let me relocate to Ottawa for this position. And to me, that was essential because um, having had 20 years in the university research environment, I understand that well and how it works and running a research group and doing running my own research programs but to understand how government science works and to have the access and to sit with my colleagues and to sit with the chief science advisor Mona Niemer and try to understand how things work and don't work and um, what is in some cases you know you know real barrier sometimes to working across departments or for for government scientists to work with university departments and I, I see barriers and it's not in a deliberate thing everyone is doing an amazing job and doing what they love and they really want the best for producing science to support our country to support sustainability of the environment in my case um but but there aren't necessarily structures built in place to be working across departments and working with universities sometimes and part of our role in the network of departmental science advisors is to look for those partnership opportunities and to advance collaboration so a lot of it's promoting the scientific excellence and looking for those opportunities to leverage and just build on, on what we have and do better with what we have. And then another aspect is the, what I would call the policy for science a, a bit more. Um, and that's it's not the science to inform the policy table, but it's things like science integrity and open science and career progression processes and things like indigenous partnerships where we, you know, there are lots of places where in all of our departments and all of our science and in universities too, we, we need to 
you know, do better at, you know, open science and making things available and, and sharing publicly. So that's um, a huge part of our mandate. And these are, it's, it's such a privilege to work in these things because like Sarah and Pascal has said, and, and Vic, it's, um, I came into this from um, a university career I was really enjoying a lot and I, maybe I'll end up back there. Um, it's, it's there's still, still lots of good problems to work on, but at some level here, is this amazing opportunity and real privilege to work on national scale programs and work with brilliant colleagues to to make more of a difference than I can by sitting in the Rockies or, or on Ellesmere Island, places I love to be, but you know, watching the glaciers melt and modeling these systems that's has its own rewards, but it's at some level it has limits too, because I'm publishing in scientific literature, talking to my own colleagues and friends and here we have a chance to reach a broader audience and, and help develop national capacity. And it's, it's a fabulous opportunity to do that. And I think especially in, in regards with climate science, um, at some point, some of the science has been clear for, for some time since maybe the first IPCC report many years ago. And so I, I think many people within working within environmental climate science are, are looking for ways to connect and have their science, you know, better brought to the to the table in terms of um, evidence and how we move next. And Megan, you asked for cats to show up, so here we go. <laughs> this is Teddy. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> well, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Teddy. That was a, a great, um, you know, introduction to him as well. So, so thank you, everyone. I think that was a really, really well summarized. A very, very complex issues. So now we're going to move into um, a, um, a poll and. Um, Oh, actually, excuse me, where are we? I just, yes. So um, if we could go ahead and launch the first poll. Perfect. So um, for the participants, you should have a poll that has multiple questions. It has three questions. So if you could answer all three of those. As people are com uh, completing the poll, um, we'd like to go into a few more questions. So the first question um, that, that we have pre-prepared is, do you know or do you have an idea of what kind of job you wanted to pursue while you were exploring your background areas of study? Science, history, cognitive science, et cetera, et cetera. What was the most contributing factor in securing a po science policy career? And I, I realize some of you have, um, you know, nuance some of this in your previous response, but if we could just do a, a round table um, to answer that question. So perhaps we'll keep the same order. So Dr. Pant, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Megan. And, and again, I, I reflect on just the complementarity in the answers to the previous questions between Pascal and Sarah and Sean and myself, and really shows the power of a community and anchored with Dr. Mona Niemer sort of as our as the person who keeps this community together. So just very happy to he have heard everything my colleague said. With respect to, to your, your question around uh, sort of uh, planning in terms of careers and sort of what kind of decisions were made earlier in my career. So I would say that definitely from my side, I've always been somebody who's been very interested in applied aspects to things so as, as even though in information science which is where my training is uh, there's a lot of work on on theoretical side of things and fundamental side to things and conceptual side to things but what i've always found most exciting uh, is on the on what happens when systems are unveiled in the world in the wild uh, and so from that perspective when i was uh, pursuing my academic journey i always tried to balance uh, a healthy mix between the conceptual rigor sort of the fundamental fundamentals, the baseline underpinnings that make great ideas, if you will, of a field that I'm interested in, but also always wanted to look at what that means in the real world. What work does it do? What impact does it have on people's lives and societies and things like that? So a lot of my work looks into into artificial intelligence, data science. Uh, that's a big part of, of really the information science field nowadays. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done from a conceptual perspective. There's lots of breakthroughs coming out in terms of algorithms and architectures and optimization techniques and things like that. But also there's a lot to be said about the socio-technical aspect of what these things mean when you actually take AI systems and put them in the world. Uh, are they explainable? Are they interpretable? Are they fair? Are they unbiased, debiased? Uh, are they privacy protecting? And so by having this kind of, of a journey, an academic journey that allowed me to sort of get grounded in the theoretical 
world, but also really understand sort of how those things mapped into the real world and what impact they were having in the world. I was able to uh, build a skill set. I was able to acquire capabilities that when I came to Natural Resources Canada, uh, this is really where when we find we have uh, some of the world's top scientists in, in our flagship uh, agencies uh, and, and sectors, such as, for example, if you think about our Canadian Forest Service, think about a geological survey, think about our Canadian Centre for Mapping and Earth Observation. So there's some really amazing work going on for instance, if you look at uh, satellite imagery uh, analysis and space-based Earth observation, so there's a lot of fundamental breakthroughs coming out of there, but also then applying satellite imagery analysis to something like flood mapping, to something like wildland fire mapping, to use it for something like uh, approximating the inventory of Canadian forests or, or, or finding uh, orphaned oil wells or abandoned mines. And so I think in that sense, really having that grounding from an academic perspective in the conceptual side of things, but then also how you apply them to create and, and, and realize value for real world policy decisions, for real world policy priorities, uh, that's a journey that I've actually taken and, and it's been one that uh, has helped me to get to where I am today. Thank you, Megan. I'll stop right there. Sorry, folks. Um, great. Thank you very much. So now um, maybe just we'll take a quick break and we can highlight the, um, the polls. So sh I'll share the results. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I think most of us are from central Canada. And then in terms of discipline, um, got a lot of natural sciences and engineering, um, followed by health sciences and followed by social sciences, I believe, and uh, a few business, maybe one person had business and other. In terms of the career stage, uh, the, the vast majority, well, not vast, a majority was early career professionals, followed by it looks like other and graduate students. Um, so that's great. It's, it's good to know who our audience is. So um, thanks, everyone, for filling out that poll. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Gallagher. Thanks, Megan. And I, uh, again, I think I'm going to contrast myself to, to Vic because I would say I'm, I'm the opposite. I, was, uh, I started off as a really curiosity-driven researcher. I mean, black holes don't have a lot of uh, applications in, um, <laughs> in many, many domains, but they're freaking awesome, right? They're so cool. And so for me, what drove me in the early part of my career was just being so curious and, and really wanting to try to understand these just fascinating, outrageous, crazy systems where you have, you know, really high temperatures and you have, I study winds from black holes that are going at tens of thousands of kilometers per second and they you smash into giant clouds and they interact with their galaxies. And so for me, that was a really motivating um, as an early career person, just these really exciting things about the world that were completely unknown. And for me, being an astronomer, it was so easy where, to see where the frontier of knowledge was because it was it was in your face. I was never, ever worried that we were going to run out of interesting questions to work on. And there was also just these new facilities that were coming online. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched when I was um, when I was in high school. And uh, there were, you know, the Chandra X-ray Observatory was launched when I was a graduate student. And the and the the primary investigator was at my university. So, uh, so it just, the field was just so exciting. And then what happens, I think, as you advance in your career is you understand a little bit more and you learn a little bit more about the structure of how science is supported and the structure of systems that, um, you know, train students and, um, and support research institutes and all of that. And then and then I think at that point, I realized, oh, that that's not really helpful. <laughs> that doesn't work very well. And there's a better way of doing it. And I, and I think that um, I have another um, another thing that I that I recognize is something I really like to do is I like to step back and look at systems and see how they're working and not working and then design new systems that, you know, achieve the goals. And so that's perfect if you're designing a facility. That's exactly what you should do, right? You figure out what you want to do and then you design the thing to, to actually do it. But you can do the same thing when, you, when you're when you thinking about, you know, how should we fund science? How should we decide who gets time on the telescope and, and all of those different things? So those questions, I think, became more salient to me as I advanced in my career. And I realized that in order to enable all of this fantastic 
discovery science, we could do a better job at figuring out um, how to support people, how to make sure that everybody gets to participate in the system. And, uh, and so those questions really became more demanding. And I also would say that I'm a kind of person who gets bored pretty easily. And so um, uh, I like to have new challenges to, to keep going. And this is the challenge that, um, that I'm working on right now. And it's really been fantastic. And, and I love working with my colleagues who have such different expertise and such different uh, perspectives. And I find that that interdisciplinary perspective um, and is just so valuable and I learned so much. And so I'm still curiosity driven, but I would say that what I'm curious about has shifted a little bit in terms of thinking about how to, how to develop and support structures that basically enable fantastic science and, and also enable incorporating science um, into policy. Thanks. Thank you, well said. Um, Dr. Michelle. Well, I, I share with Vic and uh, Sarah my um, uh, very much um, interest for science, but also my curiosity um, stuff. And, and my story is actually like this. I, I was doing my PhD and early in my career, there was this new bug. And it's just like, you know, kids in a candy store, there's a new bug, there's a new bug, we must you know, know everything about this. And it was tremendous, like, you know, all the basic question about that new bug were to be answered. And that was a new type of E. coli, the type that uh, you guys probably remember, like uh, uh, water contamination in Ontario and, and a whole bunch of things. And so this got me really into looking at different aspects of how can we stop this, as opposed to, you know, better understanding the bug itself. But we were in, 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 in an environment by which we needed to stop it. And so the very pragmatic aspect of stopping it and doing something tangible for protecting Canadians, I bought, you know, a tangent on my, on my PhD work. And I think the first milestone for me to, to drift me from purely academic work into um, advisory and policy is that someone from the government of Canada says, Pascal, you've got to work with us because of the applicability of the type of research that you do. And so I was not convinced at all. Um, and you know, Vic and, and Sarah are now no more, no more about their organization. But when you come from the outside, you say, well, what is the government organization that's going to really help me flourish as a researcher? And I, I found this amazing environment by which we can not only be a researcher, but also have this voice to guide people that are actually making policy, making decisions. They're telling you what to do in that situation. And, and that direct contact really got got me going oh man we can really shortcut you know the, the the distance in between knowing and and doing by by being there so that's the first trigger for me is to be hired almost against my will into a government of canada lab in which like i'm so tremendously uh, um, uh, happy that it happened the second part for me and it's true for my colleague as well at some point i was called to speak at international level and, I, and then I got to uh, contribute at the international level. There was things to be done. There was countries to get together, to do stuff together. And then I realized suddenly that uh, uh, putting our voice together and raising a voice as Canadian and then bring together other voices really was also very tangible in terms of moving things along and, and having a, a change in, in people's life. And that international... Um, um, experience really got me this uh, um, this desire to be not only relevant in the science, but relevant on the policy side. And the last trigger, as I, as I explained earlier, um, as I was seeing changes in my own organization uh, we work, uh, was just to express my desire to express my views. And then at some point in time, um, my organization just said, well, I think they're ready. You know, how about you come in within the executive cadre to advise us about this? And, you know, you can still be relevant in research in, in, in second order. So it's a matter of, of weighting the kind of the functions that, that you have there. But I think that the thread for me was to bring knowledge into action and that desire to always be relevant for uh, a tangible outcome. Um, and I, I guess like, like any of my colleagues there, it's, it's a matter of uh, being curious and a matter of also being lucky around the pathway to have those openings in front of you. Over to you, Sean. Thank you. Thanks, Pascal. Going, going uh, forth, I always get to echo my colleagues, so I'll do some similar themes here, but I, 
I mean, I, I certainly like like Pascal. I never imagined I would end up in science advice. I've kind of found my way here for exactly the same reason. Because as a university researcher, your your mandate is knowledge generation. But at some point, you know, I want to move into the action, knowledge to action. And so this role lets you get closer to be at that interface of taking what we know and understand and helping with with making some difference. In this case. Uh, climate understanding or knowledge to inform climate policy and to course correct climate policy to actually address the real problem, which is a huge problem for our generation. Um, but I, I started academic life as an engineering physics student, and I think my 20 year old self was set on being an aerospace engineer. I would be working with Sarah in a very different way. <laughs> but at, this, at that time, as I was at University of Toronto as an undergrad, and I was taking some courses in climate physics. And I always loved being outside and it had a real interest in environment and conservation. And I, I came to realize that all these applied math and fluid mechanics and things like that, that I was studying could actually be used to model and simulate the environment and atmosphere and weather forecast models or, or just, you know, Navier-Stokes equations solved using lots of satellites and ground data to to give our weather forecasts and climate models are similar so I, it's been this nice marriage of kind of engineering physics math into problems of the environment which are just close to my heart so it's following curiosity and following um i guess interests into into my academic career that way and i think that i i probably um was influenced by just like Sarah by some events that happened while I was at that formative stage of my academic career. So, for instance, there was this amazing ice core record that came out of Vostok, Antarctica, in the late 1980s. Just you know, papers in 1988, 1990 that showed the carbon dioxide record in these deep ancient ice cores that showed how carbon dioxide and methane varied through the ice ages. That showed so clearly how important a role these greenhouse gases play in driving climate change and that that along with ipcc emerging at the same time just really pushed me into away from aerospace engineering and into climate physics and and that's already thinking about you know environmental policy and so this was the next step essentially i was at a career stage maybe like pascal again where i'm thinking into the second stage of taking all this science and going further with it and trying to be part of that part of the solutions that we need thank you sean and thank you all again for, for really comprehensive results it's always really nice to hear the cultural and scientific zeitgeist of what was happening at the time that you made that preliminary initial decision to go where you did and of course there's always you know changes and turns but uh but thank you guys for, for providing that um that tidbit of information so I'll um, just make a note and a reminder to uh, all of the participants that um, though we're not taking questions from the audience just yet, we will be taking them uh, following these prepared questions. So please feel free to start writing those questions in the chat box as we go. So um, why don't we change the order? We'll start with, uh, with you, Sean, for this one and, and go in reverse order. Um, so the next question is, what does a day in the life look like for you? And is the work what you expected? Um, are there any sorts of files that you work on or are the meetings, um, are the meetings small? Are they large? Um, yeah. Anything else you think would be relevant? Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Super interesting. Uh a yes and no. <laughs> I, I mean, the, for one thing, it's especially in COVID time, it's really meeting after meeting. I've never been in so many uh, Teams, Zoom, WebEx, Skype environments in my in my life. And part of this is, uh, I think, the COVID reality for many of us that meeting time has actually increased rather than gone down and it's just taken a different form. But uh, it's much more complicated and full schedule than in, as a university researcher where I'm just managing my group. But that's part of the package for sure. And there's a lot of stimulation goes with that. Um, it's been, it's taken me a while to learn kind of the processes within government science and they're wonderful, but complicated sort of systems. It's, I sometimes think of it as the price of democracy in a way, everything, every decision is so careful and deliberate and well-tracked and it's it's correct and it's the necessary processes but it's less nimble than than as a university researcher you see something you just go for it you just move quickly and you do it and tackle it but there's a 
there's a huge programs already within government. They're being done within government science because they're too large for an individual researcher to be doing that of a university in general. <laughs> so it's a you know large systems and it's it's there's just some inertia within those if you want to move in a new direction, of course, correct. Although the COVID challenge Pascal can speak to has has showed that we can actually be nimble when we need to be and when all hands are on deck for that kind of converting in our case, you know, shellfish sanitation labs to COVID sampling labs or, you know, you when pressure is there, you can you can make these big changes pretty quickly. Um, setting up, you know, COVID wastewater monitoring is, is another example of that, I think. Um, but day to day, um, yeah, it's it's been like going back to undergraduate for me in some ways because I'm getting to learn all this amazing science and uh, things like all the water and weather and climate and atmosphere files were within my own research space, but environmental toxicology or plastics, and there are lots of things that are new. And that's been a real privilege to get to <laughs> learn these new things, but also get to learn from our scientific research workforce and incredibly supportive, much more support than I could have gotten at the university environment if I needed to know something about recyclability versus biodegradability of plastics i can find the relevant experts internally or at national research council and find meetings and just learn and learn and learn so that's fantastic and it's helped me to kind of hone my skills and synthesizing for moving up you know summaries of that and advice to deputy minister or adm level so this is um this parts of those were what i expected but it's been um, um also very expansive for me so thanks Thank you. Um, Dr. Michel. All right, I think the best way to, uh, to answer to this, I, I'm going to tell you my schedule today. <laughs> so this morning, I had the great, great privilege of, uh, of hosting a, a meeting of top experts on COVID and uh, ventilation. And so as you know, Canadians are quite compelled by the fact of, of being protected in different ways, aerosol is a big deal. And so it is part of the, the, the chief science officer role to convey the best science, the best expertise, the emerging knowledge, and really, like I said, to connect that to action in, in the shortest time possible. So mobilizing knowledge, hosting the mindset in Canada, and kind of a really grabbing the six highlights of this and bringing this to my kind of a the policy group, the executive, the president, and stuff. So that's 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 part of what the, uh, what I was doing this morning so to to host this uh, this amazing conversation. Another part um, is more mundane is is that uh, we've got to give dollars to some uh, researchers in order to do their thing. And so my office has a research program that disperses granting for immunology and for COVID. And so it's more kind of a reviewing the grants and see the science is correct and then. Uh, I have the privilege of writing the letters to the researchers and say, hey, you got it. You know, <laughs> thank you so much for your contribution. So that could be like this. Uh, later today, I'm going to speak to uh, the president's office because we are tabling our new open science action plan. So like my colleague, I'm, I'm in responsible for this. The Public Health Agency of Canada wants to take a stand in being more open, more transparent, raising trust and all of this. And so we design an, an open action action plan open science action plan and, and then this needs to be stamped to approve at the organizational level so it is my duty to bring this to, to the table and say yes this is what we want and this is how we're going to do this um other things is just very interesting phone calls some vp research or presidents are calling in and they say we would like to collaborate with you you know what you know what would it take and it's to you know take that phone call try to see what's commonality and and try to scope in what could be an agreement with a, a university x y and z across canada to amplify our collaboration kind of aspect so this is what i have um, on my schedule today and on top of 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 course b being at the most uh, highlight thing is to speak with you today and to uh, like i do often to some of the co colleagues inside people picking them the phone pascal um, I'd like to understand you're you're the champion for us for voice of science. You know what you know. How can it be better, and how can I progress, and how can I promote? And and so this kind of a coaching mentorship is is something that I, I totally love to do as well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Gallagher. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think both what Sean and Pascal have highlighted is that our like our days are pretty 
diverse in terms of the, the different types of activities and the different communities of people we work with. Um, and that's certainly true for me as well. But so what I'm going to share is I'm going to share one of my favorite days which was not a typical day at all, but it was a freaking awesome day. And so um, and so what I did was I went up to Timmins um, in Northern Ontario, where we have the stratospheric balloon launching site. And we are partners with the French space agency CNES, um, and they're in charge of the stratospheric balloon. So there's basically a helium balloon um, that gets, it gets pumped full of helium. It takes a couple hours actually to fill it full of helium. And then there's a gondola, which is the size of, um, uh, I don't know, a really big motorcycle. Um, and it's sort of a frame, a metal frame, and it has a bunch of payloads on it, a bunch of different instruments, and it gets attached to this balloon that then goes up into the stratosphere. And it's got a bunch of instruments on it, and it can take, um, take measurements. Um, and the balloon flights usually last between sort of 12 hours and maybe um, 36 sure. hours. Um, and uh, so while I was there, what happens beforehand is that the teams that have the different payloads, there were about 10 different instruments, there were university students, there were uh, graduate students, there were undergraduate students, there was a small business that was doing a technical prototype. Um, there were a whole bunch of research teams there and they have to do all the safety and mission assurance before to make sure everything's safe and, it, and it's working and it's and their payloads are talking to, they, they're getting the power and the telemetry, which is what sends the information down to the ground that all of that's working. So they're working together in this big warehouse and it, it I think it just showcased some of the really fantastic things that the space agency does. There's capacity development, there's all these students, they're testing new types of instruments, they're gathering science data. There was a prototype for an atmospheric science mission um, that was being tested at that point. There was a small business that's testing a new technology. Um, and they're working on this, you know, feverishly, just these teams of people working really, really hard to get everything to work dynamic. They were excited to tell me about their research and I, and I asked them questions. And so I learned about all these different projects that were really cool and the students were so excited. Um, and then we had the launch and it launches at night and it's so dramatic because they have these balloons and at first roll out the balloon and it's huge it's like 100 meters long and then they have to fill it full of helium it takes a couple hours it's rising slowly into the air and then there's a little balloon and there's the gondola and then the launch happens and they have to test the wet they're monitoring the weather and then it lifts up into the sky at night it was very very dramatic and then it has to be tracked over hours to make sure that it's it's and you have to clear the airspace. We, so they have to talk to um, the airspace control to make sure there aren't any planes. Um, and then eventually the balloon, uh, so the teams are up all night monitoring it. And then the balloon um, eventually will come down to the ground. They, they let out the helium and it'll come down to the ground. And usually it lands in the middle of the woods. And so they have to send a helicopter out and a search and rescue team to res rescue the payload and then restore the environment so that you can't even tell that the balloon fell down. Um, and so that was pretty extraordinary just to participate and to witness and all the different pieces that have to work together. And it showcased we have an international partnership. We have a partnership with the city of Timmins. We have to work with other government agencies to test new instruments, but also to make sure that, you know, we have to talk to, to make sure the airspace is clear. Um, and so that's the kind of activity you get to do as a science advisor that's really exceptional and exciting. Um, but that is not a typical day at all. But, but we do get to participate in these kinds of activities, which is really, really exciting. Thanks. Thank you. I, I think it goes without saying that you all have incredibly exciting roles and uh, I'd love to speak with all of you about your specific science and more. I don't think today we'll have time, but my goodness. Um, Dr. Plant, over to you. Yes, thank you. So I think it's great that my colleagues uh, mentioned it from different angles and different perspectives. Maybe one way I can do this and tie this back to the initial answer I gave for the first question is in terms of what my roles and responsibilities are. So for me, certainly each day is different. And one way to bucket the activities in my day are planned and emergent. So there are some things we do because that's a part of a project plan or there's a critical path for some kind of a goal that we're trying to achieve. And to the best that we can, we try to anticipate uh, deviations or variances or anomalies. But the, the planned part of the day is, is the planned part of the day uh, where we're doing things which we had intended to do uh, from the very beginning. The emergent part of the day is when we get tasked, when uh, maybe there's a request from, uh, from our executive uh, leadership team or there's a request from maybe uh, 
Dr. Mona Niemer's office or somebody like that. So, so there is an emergent part of the day too when things happen, when there's late breaking developments. Uh, for instance, if uh, let's assume there is some uh, major national event that takes place and now we have to somehow contribute to its response. Uh, so there's an emergent part of the day, which certainly then has an impact on what we can do in terms of planning uh, and executing on our plans. So there, I think every day my team and I make sure that we are buffering, we are creating a bit of that cushion in my day to make sure that even though, yes, we have a pretty chock-a-block schedule full of uh, activities to do, but that there's still some room to give in case something happens that uh, needs uh, to shift our attention away, at least temporarily. So that's one way to look at it. I would say the second way to look at it, going back to the answer I gave uh, to the initial question around my roles and responsibilities. So in the planned part of my day, there's really five main things that my team and I focus on. So the first one is certainly talent. Uh, so right now, for a lot of the work that we're doing in Natural Resources Canada, and I know from my conversations with other colleagues, you know, in government, like in any long-term organization, you need to have an evergreen HR strategy that's actually working. So we have a lot of world-renowned uh, scientists. Uh, some of them are retiring. So we need to make sure that there is sort of that outreach piece, but also the talent uh, attraction, talent recruiting piece built in as well. So a part of my day goes into sort of having talent conversations, whether it's talent st strategizing, whether it's actually interviewing somebody that is interested in, in joining Enercan. It could be because I'm on the interview because it's somebody that's joining our team, or it could be because I've been invited by one of my colleagues to be a second opinion for an interview that they want me to sit in on. So talent would be one part of that. The other piece of this would be community and what I like to say culture. So we have a community of practice for data science that we've set up inside NRCAN. My team and I participate in other broader communities of practice within the government of Canada, from Statistics Canada to NRC, etc., where there's a lot of work going on on digital transformation, a lot of work going on advanced software, advanced technology technology type stuff. So, so digital culture and enablement, and if you will, the community aspect, that's another part of where my day goes. Another part of where I spend my time is on partnerships. So speaking with my colleagues like Sean and Pascal and Sarah, and, and also not just with my colleagues in the government, but even colleagues outside government, because we have a number of interesting partnerships, as my, as my uh, colleagues have mentioned, with universities, with private research labs, with private uh, organizations, with nonprofits and charities. So that time has to be budgeted because certainly these are relationships that require time to be nurtured and to be uh, nourished, to be able to create win-win opportunities for everybody involved. Um, the next piece there would certainly be around governance. Uh, so as my colleagues have mentioned, we have a lot of policies that we play in. Either we're responsible for co-designing them within the department or we are somehow responsible for their implementation. So scientific integrity policy comes to mind. The open science action plan comes to mind. Some early thinking on citizen science, data science, those types of things come to mind. So there are that also requires a lot of consensus from across the department, being a reasonably large science-based department. We have a lot of consultation, a lot of input, a lot of feedback, a lot of great guidance we receive from our colleagues across the department. So to drive those engagements requires time. And then, of course, being a department where science is actually done, then uh, that execution part becomes very important as well, what I like to call project delivery or value realization. So if my team of data scientists is working with some scientists or policy leaders in the department, then yes, those are actually timed projects, just like when you think about a project in the real, outside of government in the real world, uh, you would think about a uh, private sector, then you would think about here's the deliverables, here's the milestones, here's the checkpoints. Uh, and so some of that goes into, so although I'm not directly involved in sort of doing the projects on a day-by-day -day basis, but from a portfolio management, from an ensemble management, from a project management perspective. So those are the five main things where the planned aspect of my day gets spent, but certainly every now and again, we get a request and the joke is we'll uh, see uh, some superior person uh, uh, a colleague would say to us i'll expect that from you before close of business on a sunday so that happens too and you have to adjust your emergent takes over your plan and then you have to adapt improvise and overcome so i'll stop right there Thank you. That, that's a great answer. And I, it almost was like you planned it. You all uh, took the question in a slightly different way, which was really nice to see. So so thank you for that. Um, so we have a lot of really excellent questions coming into the chat box. And, and again, I just echo, keep keep them coming. So we'll just start at the top. And um, if you if you wish to answer it, please, um, please do so. So the first question is, what impact do you think you have on society? And are you satisfied with it? Big question.
I, I don't think I can answer that so well, but I, I think um, one of the challenges I found, I, I would be curious to hear from my colleagues, one of, the, one of the challenges of working in science policy versus as a scientist is that it's hard to actually track your advice, <laughs> your views, your data that you bring to the table through to difference or through to policy. And I think that's a general challenge that we need to think about um, is how to actually measure success and what it looks like. Because a lot of these things happen in conversations and you're bringing your ideas, your synthesis, the expert knowledge you synthesize from talking to the real experts, <laughs> you're bringing it forward and, and you don't always know what happens to it after that, or it's harder to track that through to a final piece of legislative policy or whether this changed a direction or not. So it's a bit hard to sometimes see a few steps down the line or maybe a couple of years down the line what impact you're having or not, or not having. That's my initial experience. And so I feel like I'm often giving advice, but I don't know if it's helpful. <laughs> so that that's um, a role very new to being someone in a science advisory position. And as a scientist, you know, you publish a paper a few months later, it's out, you can see it, and here's something to show for my efforts. And that's harder within this, this world of, of science policy. Happy to turn our colleagues for the, their suggestions and thoughts here. Maybe to add on this, uh, Sean and, and, and group, I, I think, um, I, I don't know uh, the impact answer, but I, I certainly know one of the drive is to, to, to strive to be relevant, to be relevant in today's and tomorrow. And, and if only you have this look about your work, uh, sometimes it, it, you're cutting edge and so you're going to be relevant for tomorrow. And so you've got to articulate it this way. And sometimes you are very relevant in today's world, and then you've got to be voiceful and engaged. But this, this drive to be relevant is certainly one ingredient in, into impact. Uh, the impact question is, is, is quite, quite hard, but this, this desire to whatever your very, very basic research or very, very applied aspect, to link this into what's going on in society today. And I, one of my prior mentors was brilliant for this. What we were doing together is actually reading the newspaper, and I never, I'm, I'm never read the newspaper anymore the same way. You know what is really going on in the world today, and then for go back to work and and how is that you're going to do to do something about it? And sometimes you do the same way, but the paper you write is different. The, the people you talk to is different. You're a little bolder in making that cold phone call because you really want to invent. And so this strive to be relevant, I think, to me, is, is one of the key ingredients for impact. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can just uh, jump in there as well, uh, Sean and Pascal. I agree with everything you've said. You know, I, I really like how Sean mentioned that uh, measuring impact is tough, and I agree with that. And I would say the one thing that's even tougher than that is predicting impact. And one of the things is that when we look at the way that all things in government are measured from a sort of a performance evaluation perspective. Uh, many of colleagues know about this thing called the departmental results framework. So you have the high level goals of the organization, if you will, the mission and mandate, and then it sort of decomposes into lower and lower level objectives progressively so that you can then start ascribing them to specific teams, to groups, to sectors, to branches. Um, so I completely agree with, with, with Sean that yes, measuring that is tough enough, but when you're actually doing forward thinking and you're actually doing planning and you're trying to say, okay, what should be the target that we need to measure ourselves against uh, if you don't rationale, if you don't have a convincing or a persuasive justification for that, then you're really setting yourself up for failure, right? So if you have uh, some kind of a goal which you uh, really have now committed yourself to or obligated yourself to as a part of your sector or as a part of your team, and now it turns out that it realizes later, you realize later on that, well, uh, maybe maybe that was a bit too ambitious or perhaps that wasn't uh, sort of realistic, then it becomes a little bit difficult to account for where that variance comes from. So I agree that, yes, I think measuring is an issue but predicting it, which requires measuring as well, and then estimating and approximating, that also then, I would say, adds to an extra layer of complexity in the work that we do. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just very briefly say, um, I think one of the ways in which I feel that I have impact that's really valuable is being uh, somebody who's able to make connections both between people, but also between ideas and to recognize that, oh, you know what, this group of people is already 
working on this, I think they could bring their expertise and help us solve this other problem. And that, again, I mean, how do you measure that? How many connections you make? Um, that's really challenging, but uh, but there are, it, it's very satisfying where you're able to bring two people together who didn't even know that they, that each other existed and they're able to, to solve a problem. And for me, that is, is a really rewarding part of my job. Thanks. It's a great answering great questions. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So let's move on um, to our next question. Um, and I think I think you've alluded to a lot of these points, right? Curiosity, science communication, uh, action oriented attitudes, but I, I'd like you to maybe speak to what is the top one or two skills um, that you had to develop to fulfill your uh, science advisory role and perhaps to be successful in getting to that position? Maybe, maybe I can just go first, if that's okay. So, what, what I'd have to say is that I think interpersonal skills, communication skills, what's generally called sort of EQ or soft skills, that's absolutely important because as an advisor, as the name itself suggests, you're an influencer. And what you are influencing the folks that you're advising towards is a win-win outcome. Because generally what happens is you, in any, in any organizational context, certainly in inter-organizational context, there are a lot of goals, which many times are convergent, which is why people start talking about partnerships, but many goals are simultaneously also divergent. So that requires folks to have to come together to see how we can sort of, if you will, to use this uh, metaphor, but uh, cooperate to grow the pie and compete, compete to split the pie, which is to say, okay, we're coming together because we have some mutual goals. Let's work together. Let's achieve them. But let's also recognize that there are some inherent creative tensions in our very sort of roles that we occupy. And that's not necessarily always by choice. It's sometimes just due to institutional memory, it's due to organizational uh, history. So I think as a science advisor, what's very, very important is to have very strong communication skills, where you can first of all, articulate the value proposition of your advice, not just to one individual, but to groups of individuals who are implicated by the broad whole of department enterprise remit that your advice may actually impact. Uh, and then ensuring that once they buy into that win-win vision, uh, that you actually can help them then understand how to go from the upper the aspiration to the operation. Okay, you buy in on the advice, multiple people have sort of uh, agreed to what we're going to do. Okay, now let's plan on actually getting it done and, and resolving those trade-offs and, and, and managing those creative tensions requires a science advisor to have very strong communication skills to ensure that in a respectful way, you're able to tell folks that nobody gets everything they want and everybody gets a meaningful amount of something they want. Thank you. Wonderful. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I'll take a second stab. So uh, I totally agree with Vic. The communication skills are so important um, and those interpersonal skills. And I would say two other skills that um, I found have been really useful to me is, is being able to listen to people um, and to understand uh, both their science because you know i'm not an expert in all these domains so i have to listen with my with my scientific ear and try you know ask questions and understand well enough so then i can go forward and i can be the champion and the advocate and the presenter for them because i have the forum so i need to have a, a robust enough technical understanding that i can do that and that definitely requires listening and also listening to all the different stakeholders and figuring out um, as Vic said, but you know, in order to get people aligned so they can work together, you have to understand where they're coming from and what their concerns are and what their problems are. And, and sometimes it's an issue of language and culture. It's not even an actual problem. They're just not using the same language. And so you have to help, help people uh, work together. Another thing that I think is really important um, is, uh, is, is just being enthusiastic <laughs> and not being cynical um, because I, I I can, I do find, and this can happen, I think, in any organization where people have been there for a really long time, they can get a little frustrated um, and, and they can get kind of set in their ways. And so being, uh, being someone who can, who's not cynical and who is enthusiastic, uh, people often will meet you halfway and, uh, and they'll give you the benefit of the doubt and listen if you're coming from a place where um, you're excited and enthusiastic and you want to make things better. And, and that's something that for me, anyway, Anyway, um, has been has been um, very helpful. I will just echo and build on Sarah and Vic because I, I I agree that that communication is probably the single most important thing, and it's something that um, coming as a scientist as a scientist as all four of us did 
we have the analytical skills and maybe the scientific credibility, which really helps. You need that. You need a certain amount of scientific breadth and the ability to actually, uh, you know, see and understand the science or look up some nature papers if you need to and get the, get the picture. But I, I think that's not enough. You need to really be able to distill that and see through some of the complexity and just get to the bigger picture and then synthesize that. And it's a skill that I'm personally still really learning because it's, it's really true that it's the, the elevator pitch idea is, is quite, quite valid. You're often sitting in a, in a meeting and you've got 30 seconds to actually really express, you know, the heart of the idea and let people know why this is really important and why this bit of new evidence or this study or this idea is, is something we need to be paying attention to. And, and just the language around that as a scientist is, is different than what we're, what we're used to. So, you know, value proposition as Vic has brought in is, is, as, is a term I had never used in my life until two years ago. And, and now everything is, is almost pitched or thought of that way. Like here's, here's an idea of how we should partner with this group. And this is the kind of modeling capability we'll have then. And this is the kind of policy driver that this will speak to. And, and it's all kind of in that language of a value proposition rather than reducing uncertainties and blah, 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 blah. The kind of scientific language, which, you know, I'm learning to leave behind a little bit. Maybe a last word on this. Um, I totally agree. The one thing, though, I'm going to add on to this is the skill of being creative and fostering innovation. Uh, too often, we know how to describe the issue. We know who to speak to. We know to summarize what has been said. But then what? You know, what we're gonna, who can actually think outside the box and actually bring some new ways of getting at this, uh, we, we're facing now complex issues that are do not are not kind of a simplistic, you know, uh, one problem, one 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 solution type of thing. And it is a skill set to develop. There's there's a whole bunch of uh, of courses and experiences you can get there. But the um, one thing that I'm looking at for um, a younger advisors and and people going up into this chain is is how how creative uh, this person can be and and how can you foster in innovation in the thinking, but also in the tools that, that, you, that, that you have? And that speaks to this uh, beautiful interface between science and art. And I, and I can still see that there is, there's, there's a root there of, of thinking creatively that is very powerful in, in advisory and in certainly at, at that level. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> excuse me, just a moment. Excuse me. Um, so that was that was excellent. Thank you for summarizing that so well. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, but I'd just like to remind other um, participants that if you'd like to ask your question orally, please feel free to raise your hand and, and we'll um, unmute you and answer the question as well. Uh, while we're waiting on potential responses that way, I will ask a question that actually leads really, really nicely with um, Michelle with your last comments. And that's effectively, how many people do you work with on your team and what do you look for in these hires? What are such op opportunities posted? I, I'm happy to go first, uh, Megan, if that's okay. Uh, so absolutely. So uh, in terms of teams, there's a couple of things I would say, uh, and, and I think my colleagues have already mentioned this in a previous, uh, just an immediate quick question about uh, sort of what are some of the things that makes a science advisor successful. I would say certainly uh, there's a diverse set of uh, work that we do. For example, in my team, uh, some folks are working on programs. We have something called the uh, Science and Technology Internship Program. We have something called the Open Science Data Platform. So there are program elements within the team that I, I lead. There are also policy elements in the team that I lead. So I have a group that does policy work. So things like scientific integrity policy, open science policy, research scientist pro career progression policy. So there's some work on the science policy integration piece in that team. And then I also lead the digital accelerator, which is where we do a lot of this advanced technology, advanced uh, digital work. So certainly from a technical skills perspective, there are specific categories that need to be satisfied depending on which group that job is coming from. But when it comes to cross-cutting skills, I think that's very important. So I think as Sarah mentioned earlier about attitude and personality, I think that's a very important part that we look for irrespective of what group in the team, in the, in the sector you're going to go into. Uh, things like, uh, for instance, uh, being empathetic, 
ascribing to the values and ethics of the public sector writ large, but also of our department. Uh, our own team also has certain uh, values and ethics, uh, a, a, not a charter, I would say, but a list of aspirational objectives that we have. So basically, we look for two sets of things. Certainly, we look for the technical skills and the functional skills that map to whatever job it is that is being advertised. But when it comes to every hire, we certainly, and the, the interview gives us a good opportunity. The writing sample part of the process gives us a good opportunity. Reference check recommendations help us to get a good opportunity but we certainly want to look at the emotional quotient of the individual we're hiring because just as a science advisor at the executive level needs to have some of the skills my colleagues have articulated i think the whole team has to have those skills because ultimately the science advisor is actually surfacing up the collective intellect and the aggregate wisdom of their team that they're leading thank you And feel free to jump Maybe in. A, a, a quick add on to this. Um, um, experience and education can be acquired. Uh, education can be acquired quite quick. And so obviously, we're looking at a depth, you know, there's, there's a foundational depth there. But to have a miss this and a little miss of that to me, that, that's never been a showstopper. I'm looking at someone that has a very deep understanding of, of, of the world, basically, you know, both the policy side and and what's going on and simple question you know what are the current priorities and in, in the policy world in canada like and what are the major challenges that the planet is facing are usually questions that kind of a really kind of a three mouths and people that are really connected to what's going on and, and people that are a little kind of a focus into their their little world and, and to me that that is one set of, of things and second thing that vic mentioned this to me the um um Oh, can can I trust you? You know who you are in in terms of a person. To to me is is foundational to team building. It's foundational to trust, and and it's it's foundational to how people are going to see you as you know. I'm going to trust your voice, and therefore um, you're going to be able to be a, an actor of change. And and we put tremendous value to to this. You know, will I trust you? Uh, will I be um, able to um, to, to trust you with very sensitive information, will I be able to to trust you with with being taking the being right at the time of how high emotional stress and 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 everything kind of a out of form and shape around you and and these are so kind of a top of mind as well. Of course, the 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 depth of the number of courses and stuff. You know, I see some chatting there. You know, what is the next course I can take and stuff. Uh, there is there is obviously an appeal for someone that has a long, long, long um, career of continuing education, um, and in in many different areas. I think that that's very appealing. But but in in many instances, this is not the showstopper. And in, in, you know what is the next next kind of a grasp in terms of like hiring someone for for those type of positions. So I'll just, uh, I actually don't hire anyone. So um, it, within, that's not, uh, that's not the nature of my job. So I don't, I don't have anyone who reports to me. Um, I'll talk about a little bit about my experience that's sort of out of, out of normal, that is really relevant um, that, especially for someone who's coming in an academic track. So you might have an opportunity, for example, to serve on the, say, if you're a graduate student, the graduate student committee for your professional society, or to organize a conference or to, to, um, you know, put together something like that. Th those sorts of activities are considered service in academia, but they actually allow you to get a lot of the skills that are really relevant in a sort of um, advisor kind of a role. Um, so, so just doing the taking your courses and doing your research and writing your papers, those are really important in terms of getting the credibility that that Sean mentioned. You really have to be a credible scientist to have the sort of street cred of your colleagues. But a lot of the valuable skills come from the extra stuff. Um, and, uh, and so that's also a, the kind of experience that you can get um, by, uh, yeah, helping to organize a conference or serve on a committee for your professional society or the um or within your university and those are all really relevant volunteering i mean so you know being being on the board of a local philanthropic organization that kind those kinds of experiences are really valuable for sort of rounding out your um your profile base 
And, and like Sarah, I don't, I don't uh, have a group. I'm, I'm kind of sitting outside the org chart and uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada has a long, has a large cohort of science advisors working in various roles and the, and they're very talented. And what, if I try to think of what makes them really um, strong, it's, it's some of that, that they, they have a science background and they have some breadth within that, but also that creativity that, that Pascal mentioned and the initiative really to, if you're given a challenge and a problem, they'll just go out and they'll find some expert in Germany that just knows exactly is the expert in the world on this problem. And then we, we can tap that my, person's mind for best advice and they'll connect us to a couple of other people and we can build our understanding of a, of a particular problem or, or a question. And, and so I think those soft skills around creativity, initiative, open-mindedness to be able to do things in a different way, those are, those are all really valuable. Thanks, Sean. I'd be remit not to mention that CP CSPC is always uh, recruiting volunteers. And so that's one organization uh, that you could volunteer with. And I personally have gained a lot of really great experience um, working with it. Okay, great. Um, so I don't see any hands raised. We'll keep going with the um, the written questions. But again, if you do want to raise a, or if you, if you want to ask a question um, orally, please just raise your hand. Um, okay, so the next question, again, was alluded to, but the question is, what are some good entry points apart from internships and fellowships, especially for mid, um, mid career folks who have, um, for instance, in this case, international policy experience? But perhaps if you can answer the question more broadly as well. Okay, maybe I can uh, take a one pass at it, uh, Sarah. Uh, that's a great question. And certainly, you know, I think it's important to separate the, the vehicle from the actual substance of a job, because as we know, in the government of Canada, there are a number of vehicles that can be leveraged. There is the interchange model. There is the, uh, there are what are called casual contracts. There are determinant uh, positions. Uh, so I think, I think there needs to be a conversation that happens between a hiring manager and a candidate on what is the most appropriate sort of vehicle to uh, operationalize that relationship. But I would say that uh, the substance part of it. So how does that work? I would say exactly to Sean's, uh, actually Pascal's point of, first of all, you know, uh, any any individual may have a very specific focal interest where it is that they want to go and work in that that sort of role in government but as pascal mentioned earlier you you have to know the broader picture you have to start by saying okay what is the government's priority so if the priority is environment and climate change uh, emissions reduction the net zero commitments uh, carbon sequestration, utilization and storage, things like that. So you even if something that you want to do is a very sort of precise area that you want to focus in and get a job in that space, you still have to understand the big picture paradigm and map and tie your interest to what that bigger picture looks like. And it may be a multi-step mapping, right? I mean, you may be a specialist in a given field and, and that field may be very relevant to some big picture priority in a way, but you have to be able to explicate that. You have to be able to enunciate that. Once that is done, then using tools like LinkedIn, using tools like, uh, for instance, the Global Employee Directory Service, you can go out and you can start searching for what kinds of opportunities exist. And, you know, one way to do this is to look for jobs, but a lot of times the contract positions or the positions that may be a bit more short term, great opportunities for you to, by the way, get in and prove yourself and really come in and establish your bona fides. Those might not be things which are registered as jobs anywhere. So you want to find the leaders in the organization that you're targeting. So if you're talking, let's say, international policy, I certainly don't want to say that global affairs is the only place where international policy is done. Enercan has a international policy shop as well, where uh, they do a lot of work on international trade policy, etc. But the idea is, uh, sometimes to get that job, you don't have to be searching for a job, you have to look for the, the leaders in the organization who happen to be the leaders of that group that you would potentially want to work for, look at their posts, look at what they're saying on Twitter, look at what they're saying uh, on LinkedIn, look at what they're saying in professional fora when they're going to trade shows and when they're going to conferences, uh, what are their main priorities and mandates and missions that they're talking about? And again, it's a mapping exercise. So now you can reach out to them and you can certainly introduce yourself and say, look, you know, I, I heard what you said or I read what you said, and I feel that my skills uh, would be very appropriate for this in this following way. So. 
looking for a job there's many vehicles which you need to be aware of so you need to make yourself aware of what treasury board permits as different ways for you to work in the government or for the government it may not always be a full time indeterminate job right from the start there may be some other ways you have to sort of treat that like a gradient like a slope and then on the other way you have to look at the substance and not necessarily just go searching for jobs but actually look for people who you resonate with and then look out for what their priorities are what their missions are and then make the introduction and recognize that you know uh, not every single email you send will get responded to that's just the nature of life uh, so cast a wide net budget enough time and make compelling and persuasive connections and eventually something will work out thank you megan i can just uh, mention as well uh, one very powerful um link in integration is to do some part of the grad stu uh, studies in collaborations with um, a government of Canada person. Uh, it just happened to me. I just took him on my uh, main advisor to be a government of Canada person, and then it, it opened doors for me. And I've done, I replicated that model, I think, dozens and dozens and dozens of times after having master's students, PhDs, and postdoc, having a foot in the academic and a foot in the government. Uh, and it just happened to be, I'd say, Three quarter of, of these people after that got a job in government of Canada, and some of those actually got an appetite to actually move to be managers, leaders, and things. And so this cross linkage in between academia and government is is functioning very well. There are uh, platforms, initiatives, and things out there. CSPC is one of it by which we have science and policy people brain melting down. There's programs uh, I can mention, my tax and others that are, are in the business of taking mid-level people and putting them into the right place to complete some experience. There's new network. There's a network of science advisor, international science advisor out there. You can get involved and really get a sense of what it is to be. There's a whole bunch of uh, implication of this. But really, this um, to have a foot uh, in the academia and a foot in some level of municipal, provincial, federal um, um, government is is really an eye opening for a lot of people, and this is this is a, uh, an approach that we take now uh, for recruiting because we we know it's hard to explain bluntly to people, but once they get a taste, then they get they get really an understanding and what it is to be um, functioning within within an advisory role or a manager role and having a science background after. Um, so I'll just jump in. I, I it's it, it's already two thirty almost. We're a minute to two thirty. So um, I just wanted to ask: Do you have another few minutes to answer maybe maybe last remarks? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you for those additional few minutes. Um, for those of you though who do have to jump off, I just wanted to remind you that there will be a um, feedback. Uh, actually, sorry. So uh, you might need to correct me. So um, there is a feedback poll. I think for those who jump off early, you may not get it, but um, I suppose we'll see. But at the at the very least, I, I just formally want to thank all of our speakers for their time, for their advice. It's it's really really well received. Um, there were a few questions that we didn't get to, unfortunately. But um, I, I suppose that's the way it goes. With that being said, there are also some really lovely comments in, in the chat. So I, I welcome the speakers to take a peek at those. Um, if you do have any questions or feedback for, for future sessions, please do email info at sciencepolicy.ca and that will be added to the chat. So. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Soho. So, okay, so great. So the feedback uh, survey is in progress. Um, if you don't mind filling that out before you hop off. Um, but maybe we'll end just by asking the panelists for their final thoughts, maybe um, whatever it may be. Open-ended. <laughs> so maybe Dr. Plant, I'll turn to you and we'll do the original order. Yes. So I, I just uh, just to summarize really the, the, the core nature of the science advisor job, which all of my colleagues have very eloquently articulated, is really... Um, that intersection of science and policy. So the fact that, for example, NRCAN, we are a science-based department or we're a science-based economic department. So at the end of the day, if the science informs the what, the policy part informs the so what. So I think being a science advisor means that you can build that bridge from based on knowledge, justified true belief from the what to the so what, the science policy integration. Thank you. So I'll take the second uh, the second uh, piece of it. Um, I think what I see for for the science advisor's job is is 
is also is to be the champion for science within the department and also the champion of the science that's done and enabled by the department to the outside and that's something where um, being that champion is something that you absolutely have to be really passionate about i feel that it's important and impactful which allows me to do that in a sincere way and uh and and it's definitely what i really love about the job Thank you, Sarah. Vic, maybe one one kind of last word for me is get connected. Like, I mean, the people you know, the colleagues that you have, the collaborators, is a strong currency. You know, the people that know a lot, a lot of the people internationally, nationally, people really well connected is a very, very tough currency for uh, being an advisor. Um, and uh, and additional to what um, my colleague has just said, this is uh, one of the key considerations for me. Thank you. Yeah, I really agree with that. Um, and I, I think personally, this is a really exciting time for science policy in, in Canada because there's a huge appetite for more science and more evidence at the table and decision making. And we see that with um, Mona Niemer's initiatives and the creation of our network. We're still very new. We're just getting going, I would say. We're still growing. Um, open science is just coming and growing. and. CSPC itself, I'll turn back and finish with that, it's really hit its stride. And if you haven't attended the annual conference of CSPC, it's it's a great place to get networked and start to meet people and start to make this bridge from your science into this policy. And it's a lot of it really comes down to just networking and knowing these people and, and making sure our science stories are, are told and, and understood and really drilled home in some cases. So thanks. Wonderful. Um, thanks, everyone. It was such a privilege to, to moderate this session. So we'll, we'll end there, but keep on uh, contributing to the wonderful science and, and policy that you're doing. Thank you very much.